Hello, hello, and welcome to this month's workshop. Um, today, you will see that I have a special guest with me, and this is Sarah Miller from Homeschool for Him, and she's here to talk to us about reading. So we'll give you a minute to come join us. Say hi in the comments and let us know where you're joining us from. And if you have any questions about reading, you can drop those in the comments and we will take those at the end. So let us know where you're from. Hey, Pam. Um, and let us know what reading questions you have. And we'll make sure we have plenty of time at the end to answer questions. Um, and while we're getting started here, so Sarah, tell me about your homeschool day today. Hi, Cynthia. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, yeah, our homeschool day was kind of a hot mess today. We had contractors over to talk about a project that we're thinking about doing. So my kids watched some TV, some educational shows, and I did some reading with my daughter. And that was our homeschool day today. So life got lifey at our house, but that's okay. <laughs> that's one of the great things about homeschooling is that we can adapt, right? Absolutely. We had a pretty typical morning. We only had, we've had several weeks or we've always had something going on. And today was thankfully not one of those. But then we had a whole house of our robotics team over this afternoon. And so awesome. that was loud and crazy and busy, um, along with my husband who works from home. So I don't know how much his coworkers heard in the background um, <laughs> with all of our four little robots running around and three laptops and trying to help everybody the best we could as we get ready for our competition next month. Um, that so, awesome. yeah, it's a lot of fun. So my kids are nine, 11 and 13. Thus they're into robotics competitions and Sarah introduce uh, yourself and tell me about who you are homeschooling. Sure. I'm Sarah Miller. I blog over at homeschoolingforhim.com where I help parents get started with homeschooling and teach their kids how to read. And before I did that, I uh, am also a mom of two. And before that, I was a teacher in the classrooms for over a decade, um, teaching kids of all ages there as well. Uh, my kids are a little bit younger. So if you have younger kids, I am right there in the trenches with you. My oldest is six and my youngest is three. Wonderful. So as we announced before, tonight we're talking about reading and Sarah is a great person to bring on here. She's going to share more about something special she has for you next week related to reading at the end. But first we're going to go through our four tips for encouraging a love for reading for all ages. Obviously between the two of us, we span right now a wide range. Um, and I started homeschooling in the preschool years myself. Um, so we've got a little bit of experience here and we hope you will chime in in the comments as well with what you would add to the conversation. Uh, let us know if you have comments or questions and we'll definitely hit all the questions at the end, but we wanna hear from you as well. So the first thing we're gonna talk about in um, encouraging a love of reading is reading together as a family. So even with two in middle school and one teenager, we read aloud as a family, including my husband, every single day. Um, we still do a bedtime read aloud. Um, we use a literature-based curriculum. And I actually give my husband a lot of the just stories that are meant to be read aloud for school, and he reads them. I don't read them during school time. He reads them for bedtime stories, and sometimes I sit in, sometimes I don't. Um, right now, we're actually reading a series called The Ranger's Apprentice. And I have to confess, when my husband first suggested this series, I, I thought it was a really stupid series, and I thought it was really, really boring. And I was the one that ordered the audiobook of book number two because it wasn't so stupid and crazy. It was really amazing and awesome. And we are currently on book five as a family and we just picked it up in October. It was an audiobook we listened to on our big road trip. Um, so, but listening to books and reading books as a family, I think was a good and bad thing when my kids were learning to read because my husband had read so many good, bigger books than what my kids could read. 
They didn't want to read the beginner readers because they were so boring because they'd heard big and exciting stories. They wanted to read big and exciting stories themselves. So that caused some frustration mm -hmm. when they were just learning to read for themselves. Um, so Sarah, what are you reading at your house right now? Yeah, so we love read alouds at our family as well. And I love that you said that you do them at bedtime because we actually do ours at breakfast. So Ooh. while the kids are eating breakfast, I get out all of everything that needs to be read for the homeschool day. And we read all of those things together. We do our Bible reading and our history or our science reading or whatever else we have for the whole day all at breakfast time. So, and we also read a chapter book as well. So right now we're reading The Wizard of Oz. Um, but I actually brought one that we just finished. This, I think, is a really good one if you're just getting kids started with reading out loud. It's The Big Book of Animal Stories by Thornton Burgess. And both of my kids loved this book. It's a great read aloud because the chapters are super short. They're only a page or two. And there's lots of illustrations in here, which helps keep younger kids engaged in the book as well. So this was one of our all-time favorites. My kids loved the animal characters in there, and it's the same animal characters in every story. So they really loved that as well. So if you've oh, got younger kids, I would highly recommend that one. That's fun that they could get to know the characters throughout the story. My kids get pretty attached <laughs> to certain characters. And I will say we're using a read aloud for some music right now. And Ooh. we love my 11-year-old loves to read the comics. So we're using this series, but it's called The World's Greatest Art. This is composers, but there's also artist books. Um, but while there's fun and informative pieces, there's also really silly cartoons. And so my 11 year old likes to take over the reading aloud when it comes to the cartoon section. So um, even with middle schoolers, they like the picture books and they can be just as valuable to teach them. That's awesome. So Cynthia, would you say that kids ever outgrow reading out loud? Because one of the most common questions that I get asked about it is when are kids too old? And also when should we start who's too young? Hmm, well, I'm gonna go with no and no and no. <laughs> um, so while I split up the reading aloud and let my husband read our literatures and more of our fiction read alouds at bedtime, we actually read our non, we start our day with our nonfiction read alouds. And again, I cheat. While I love reading aloud and I love doing stories with my kids, I also really like to cheat. And we love using audiobooks. So we have our history book on audiobook. And so I just press play and that helps us all get our day going. If I'm running late drinking my coffee, I can sit and still drink it. And they can enjoy doing puzzles or other things. And so we actually start our day with audiobooks um, and reading a lot as well. And so today we did our history for our American history. We did our music and sometimes we have a devotional as well. So that's what we're reading that. aloud with two in middle school. So I don't think you ever do. And read alouds mm -hmm. in the car get a lot more fun on road trips when everyone gets older because you can do bigger stories. I love that. Yeah, that's so wonderful. And I, I think the reverse is true too. I don't think you're ever too young to do oh, no. read aloud. I think I've got pictures. I was actually showing my kids today because I'm getting ready for something exciting next week. I have pictures of myself reading out loud to both of my kids when they were just a couple of days old that I found and was showing them. And I think that's so important to start them out young because even when they can't understand the story that you're reading, they still understand that they're having that positive experience with you and they start to relate that positive experience to books. And so you can help your kids develop a love of reading and a love of books from when they're very young by reading out loud to them at that young age. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe we should move on and talk about what to do when kids don't love reading. Oh, I think that's a great idea. So step two is uh, what, Sarah? So I want to talk about what to do when we have kids that just don't love reading, because I think that sometimes that can start to negatively impact our homeschool. 
if we get a kid that hates reading and then they have to read all the time for homeschool, then they start to hate school, right? And so mm -hmm. the trick for that, I think, is to try to separate the reading from the learning as best as you can and make it so that when your kids are learning, they don't have to be reading in order to do that. We did this in our homeschool with writing because my son really struggles with writing and he's had that struggle now for a couple of years. And so I realized pretty early on that although he couldn't write the answers to the math problems, he knew the answers to the math problems. And the same was true for the other subjects as well. And so what I started doing was helping him so that he could continue to progress in math and in science and in all of these other subjects without needing to write. So I would write for him or I would just have him tell me the answers out loud or just anything that I could do to separate the writing portion of learning from the learning portion. So I'm separating out the subject that's difficult from everything else. And so as I started to do that, he was able to continue to progress in those subjects without having to actually be able to write. And then we were able to just isolate the frustration with writing to just during writing time. And so it didn't bleed over and make him get frustrated with math and science and spelling and all those other subjects. And I think that you can do the same thing with reading if you can find those creative ways that your kids can continue to learn without having to read. So like you were talking about the audiobooks, those are a great strategy for that, or finding video lessons that your kids can watch, or even just reading the textbook out loud to them. Anything that you can do so that they can continue learning and continue to enjoy that subject without having to read the materials, I think is really helpful. I agree. We, uh, we also had a struggling writer. Um, but was very bright and has I actually started the first curriculum we bought was an all-in-one curriculum And so you had to read at this level you had to write at this level you did math at this level Well, my student wasn't ready to write that much But we could talk about the things and so we do mm -hmm. a lot of talking and a lot of discussion Because it lets us all process the information that we're hearing through our read-alouds um, and even has different people take turns um, doing other things. So we separate those one skills. Um, I like to think about it when we do an art project. Um, again, kind of with the writing, but it comes with uh, reading and stuff. So decide, is it important that they read the directions independently? Or are you focusing in your art lesson on creating the art? If you're focusing on creating the art, then it doesn't matter who reads the directions. We don't need that to be a stalling point for the assignment. And so I've always been, a lot of our schoolwork, I have picked the one thing we're working on. So for a time we made lap books because it was little bits of writing, but I also really wanted to practice the scissors. So for that assignment, they had used the scissors. I wasn't gonna help them cut, but for another time, when we were trying to make a pretty present, an art project to give to grandma, that wasn't when we were practicing our scissors, so I would help. Um, because the goal of that was to send grandma something pretty. So we kind of pick and choose at any point across any subjects, what one skill or maybe two skills we're working on at a time, and then try to creatively accommodate everything else. Um, I mean, I had, one of my kids was really advanced in math really early. So we were using Khan Academy to kind of check off all the boxes. Well, they couldn't read the screen. So I sat there and read it to them so that it didn't hold them back from advancing in that area. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love what you said about choosing one goal for the activity, because I think that really helps give clarity about what to focus on and whether or not that resource is going to be a good fit. I know I get that question a lot when it comes to audiobooks, like do audiobooks count for homeschool? And I think that if you can decide what your priority is, that's how you can, you know, figure that out, right? Do right. audiobooks count for teaching your child how to read? Probably not. But do they count for teaching your child history? If your goal is for them to be exposed to that material, then definitely. So it comes Absolutely. down to figuring out what your goal is. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which kind of goes into our third tip, which is about 
following our child as far as when you learn how to read and how fast you get them to read, um, which can look a lot of different ways um, for each kid. I mean, so I have three kids and I taught them to read in three different ways. So my oldest kind of taught herself um, when I kind of started linking like consonant, vowel, consonant words together and sounding them out. It just kind of clicked and she took off and that was that and we were reading. Um, my second child actually went to a public school for pre-K, so he learned some of the basics there. And then we used a traditional curriculum, um, the built-in phonics program and went through the sounds and he wasn't really in a rush, but nothing really had trouble sticking and he just kind of went and was off and reading. Um, and then my third child, um, nothing was quite clicking. Um, he had kind of hit and miss of the readiness symbols, um, the different readiness signs of, you know, he saw his letters, he was interested in holding a book, um, but he couldn't really put the sounds together. But he really wanted to go beyond that and different things. And so we did start investigating some things because being my third kid, I personally had the experience with how this could go and knew how in our family approximately when it kind of was happening. And so for that child, they weren't matching their siblings, which siblings don't have to match. They can all learn at different points. Um, but he was ready, but not ready. He was eager to do it, but it wasn't clicking for him to actually be able to do it. Um, and so it became a frustrating point. Um, he was diagnosed with dyslexia and we were able to use one of the Ortham Gillingham curriculum programs. And it was slow going and sometimes we repeated lessons and we got through the whole first book in about a year and a half, the first level. Um, and I bought the second level saying, okay, we're gonna keep going but something clicked in between and suddenly it wasn't hard anymore and suddenly that lesson was too easy and when I skipped ahead to spot check him he could easily read the books at the end of level two so he was off and gone his own um I also but he's still dyslexic even though he was picked up reading after that point because there were a lot of the strengths that he had that come with being a dyslexic too um so we had all that but I still see that last child tends to gravitate to a different kind of book. Um, he likes to read more graphic books that have smaller bits of text and things like that. But graphic novels don't have to look like something um, to be a big deal. So a lot of publishers have started making more graphic novels to really teach the meatier subjects. Um, and I have three of our favorites. I only have two of them actually with me. One is the science comic series. And these are nonfiction science topics. Um, and so it's full of illustrations. But these are straight on nonfiction. There may be a little bit of a story, but the story really just becomes how to give the information. Um, so several, I think, one child has the digestive system of this in their bed right now, and another child has the solar system from this series in their bed right now. Um, and another one, and this kind of goes back to talking about the audiobooks. If you have an older child that's continuing to struggle to read, but you really want to introduce them to more classic literature that may be more age appropriate um, for their age, is there's more and more of the classics are being turned into graphic novels. So this is the Odyssey, um, but it's the full Odyssey, but it's in a more traditional graphic novel approach. So, and another really great thing is when you read classics uh, with your kids in abridged versions and children's versions, they learn the story so that when they get older or when you do start homeschooling high school, then they know the story, and so it's easier to follow the more original format of the writing. So mm -hmm. my kids have really been into Greek myths, and my oldest at the last year's used curriculum sale picked up a tradition, a older translation of the Odyssey, and she was enjoying reading this like original English translation, 
because she already knew the story so she could appreciate the format and the literature, um, which is not something I ever had as a kid. <laughs> so I'm looking right. forward to being able to give that to them. And they don't think of it as a horrible, boring classic because they can enjoy the story because they've enjoyed it already for many years. Mm -hmm. I love that. Such a powerful way to introduce those stories to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love what you said about your different kids and just how their journeys were different too. I think that's something that's so important for us to keep in mind as parents, because it's so easy to get that idea in our head of here's how it should work and here's what it should look like. And reading is so individualistic and there's so much of it that is just completely up to your child's personality and genetics and just all these factors that as much as we'd like them to be are outside of our control. And even from one sibling to the next, everybody's reading journey is going to look different and that is okay. I love that. So I think one of the things that's important is to watch your child and to observe and sort of follow their lead in this and make sure that you're not teaching them to read before they're ready, for example, um, and that you're waiting until they're, they're, you're really seeing those signs in them. So do we wanna talk about what those are? Go ahead, that sounds like a great thing to talk okay. about. Okay, so when I'm trying to decide if a child is ready to learn to read, there's four big things that I'm looking for. Um, and I use the acronym ABLE, like are they able to read? or able to learn to read. Um, and the A stands for awareness. So I'm looking to see if they are pointing out letters when they notice them. So like as you're driving down the road, are they noticing that the signs have letters or like when they see letters on a t-shirt or letters on the front of a store, do they recognize that those are letters or maybe do they ask what that says? And then the B stands for books. So you wanna make sure that your kid um, has some experience with books and understands how to hold one and how to turn the pages and even things like text is read from the top of the page to the bottom, the left to the right. Um, and that sounds really intimidating, but the way to teach that is just as you're reading a book to your child, you're going to just point to the text as you're reading. And that will help them learn that skill just by osmosis as you're reading to them. Um, the L in ABLE stands for letters, so you want to make sure that your kids recognize the letters and that they know at least some of their letter names. It's not necessary for learning to read, but it's really helpful to have that shared vocabulary of what the letter names are. And then you also want your kids to know that there's a capital and a lowercase version of each letter and that those two versions both say the same thing. And then the E stands for excitement, and I think this is the most important one. So before you teach your child to read, you want to make sure that they're really excited about it, that they love books, and that they're just really ready and excited to read. That's super important, the excitement. Um, one yeah. thing that we do even with our teenagers is when we go to the library, um, I let them get whatever they want. We have, yeah. you know, I think so far there is one book that I've not let my children, across all three of them, pick out because they weren't wasn't quite something that was good for our family. But even if it's something I'm a little uncomfortable with, there's a lot of things I'd rather have my kids experience through a book than to have them experience in person. And so it's a safe way for them to explore a lot of ideas and interests um, that don't take mess for me or don't take them having the experiences themselves. So, um, but, That's a really you know, good point, yeah. I mean, we were in the Ranger Apprentice series. There was a huge, um, one of the earlier books, I think it might've been around book three. There was a whole storyline that had to do with one of the main characters that we'd all grown to love, um, got addicted to drugs. It was kind of forced mm -hmm. upon him with this plot of the story. But then that created some amazing conversations as a family to talk about what addictions were and drugs and really the complexities of what it is to have to know someone and for them to be addicted because it's not always an active choice that they make and it wasn't in this story. Um, and then the people who came around them and supported him so that he could recover as well. Um, you know, and I didn't know that was part of that story, uh, but it created a really awesome opportunity for us to do it. 
Um, and to have that conversation in a way that really connected with my kids versus mm -hmm. a different situation of us just reading it in a textbook or such. Um, yeah. But, you know, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing that right now with The Wizard of Oz. I had no idea that the book is significantly more violent than the movie. Um, so <laughs> preview your book before you read it out loud to your kids. Um, yeah. But it, it has been a really good jumping off point for discussions about behavior and just just different things and i think that that is another one of the reasons why it's so important to read out loud to kids because it's such a great discussion starter yeah and reading it has a family means that we get to have the discussion has a family um you mm -hmm. know so we have good literature but i will also say that i'm completely guilty of knowing exactly where the minecraft star wars and lego books are at the library because that's also what my kids yeah. take home and like to read so i mean minecraft has great you know fiction series which we own all of the 8-bit series um and everybody reads them but then there's also ones that just help them build and play on their screens and kind of build their engineering skills as well um and those fan fiction books can be a great way if you have a child that doesn't want to maybe read what you consider more traditional literature, that having those fan fiction books is a great way to get them off and going um, with what mm -hmm. they want to read. We read lots of Star Wars encyclopedias here. But no, you can't check that one out because that's actually one of them we just returned. You need to get a different Star Wars encyclopedia this week. Um, yes. <laughs> That's awesome. But I mean, how much are your kids learning to love reading because you're just giving them the freedom to choose things that they're interested in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I mean, if you think about that as an adult, it makes so much sense, right? Like if mm -hmm. you're going to the library to pick out something for yourself, wouldn't you rather choose something that you're interested in than have somebody else tell you what you need to read? So, I mean, yeah. we can give our kids that same freedom and flexibility. Absolutely. Yeah. So Sarah, you've got something coming up next week um another special event about teaching reading at the very beginning of our kids reading journey um can you tell us a little more about that yeah definitely i'm so excited about this next week i'm going to be sharing a special live class about three keys to raising lifelong readers and it's going to be next monday night at 8 p.m Eastern and also next Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern. They're both the same. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, three strategies that I use in my homeschool to help my kids learn to love reading through the process of learning to read. Because I think so often we start out on the right foot and we get kids so excited about reading out loud and they love to be read to. And then we get to the process of teaching them to read and we just hit a giant wall because that process of learning to read is so boring and so frustrating for so many kids. You were talking about it earlier about how your kids had been exposed to great literature and then they got to the readers and they were so bored, you know? Um, and I, I think that happens to so many people. And so I wanna talk about how you can teach your kids to read in a way that actually makes reading fun and exciting and motivating for them. And so that'll be, next week monday and tuesday and i'm really excited to share it yeah so i just dropped the link to that it's three keys to raising a lifelong learner um so that webinar is going on um and that sounds so great i know i'll be getting my tickets for that and then you also have something else to help us actually teach our kids the basics coming out too don't you I do, yeah, it's the Reading Better Together curriculum and I'm super excited about it because it uses side-by-side -side reading books. So kids are actually reading these books alongside of their parents as a part of the curriculum. So the books are designed so that each page has a parent um, section where the parents can read and, and that sort of advances the story and has most of the details. And then there's a child section that only contains words that the kids have already practiced in their reading lessons. So I've gotten some amazing feedback on these stories. Kids are so excited to read them and to share them with their family and just so proud of being able to read these stories. And I love that I can include that as a part of a reading curriculum. So there'll be details about that on the, the class on Monday and Tuesday as well. 
That sounds so great. We had some of those read together books when my kids are reading and it definitely created an opportunity to really draw my kids in and not just say, let mommy read you a story, but let's read this together because look, you have a part that you can read as we read this book. Um, mm -hmm. And it really made them excited to be able to do it together and to share reading the story with me as the parent. Um, and then to be able to take it to grandma and everybody else to be like, hey, look, let's read this together. I have a part where I can read in this story too. Um, so it really is quite an exciting thing and builds their confidence as simple as it is one word at a time. Exactly. Yeah. I think that motivation piece is so important because kids get into those reading curriculums, you know, and they've got the stack of flashcards and they've got the lesson and it's so hard for them to see how all of this tedious, frustrating work is going to translate to them being able to read those books that they love. And so I think that these side by side readers are the missing piece there. That's so wonderful. Well, Sarah, um, I think we had a couple questions coming in. Yeah. This. And so let's go ahead and address those. And if you have a question, go ahead and drop it in the comments and we will do our best to answer it. So the first one that we have that was submitted ahead of time was we've been working on letter sounds, but when we put a consonant or consonant word together, he gets stuck and can't sound anything out but the first letter. He knows how to pick apart words. He's not really sure how to make the connections to move from the letter sounds to the words because all they can identify, they can identify the letters and they can sound the first sound but they can't really connect the rest of the words. So Sarah, what would you say for that? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is the idea of blending. And I think it's really a, a tricky spot for a lot of kids where they get stuck. So there's two places that kids usually get stuck with blending. And the first one is understanding the idea of, okay, I have to take these separate letter sounds and I have to put them together to make a word. And that can be really tricky for kids. So the way that I like to do that is with magnet tiles. And I brought some, um, you might have some of these at your house. My kids love these. Um, but what we'll do is we'll either like use a magic marker or a sticky note or whatever and write a letter on each of the different magnet tiles. So if you're trying to blend the word cat, you'd write the C on the first one, the A on the second one, the T on the third one, and you'd have them say K, A, with the separate magnet tiles, and then you would stick them together, and you would show them that when you put them together, k at makes cat. So that's kind of a good way to introduce the idea of blending if they're confused about the idea. And then from there, the other confusion, whoops, the other confusion that people sometimes have is they'll be able to blend the word together, but then they'll forget what they blended. So if your child is saying something like, at turtle then you know like they're understanding the idea of we have to put these sounds together to make a word but they probably don't have enough working memory to remember all of those sounds that they blended at the same time so they might be remembering that last t sound maybe that's where turtle came from or it might just be a completely random word so if they're blending and then coming up with a random word at the end then you want to try something called successive blending. So what you're going to do is have them do the first two sounds. So k, a, k, and then once they have k, then you're going to add that last sound, the t, k, t, makes cat. So they're starting with just the two sounds and then adding the third. Hopefully that makes sense. So those are great those suggestions. Are two, yeah, those are the two spots where people usually get stuck. We love our magnet tiles. I think we got them when a child was two and they're still in use today. So I know my kids totally <laughs> worth it. Um, so in our other question that we received was frustration for dyslexic readers. Um, and we already touched on this a little bit um, between separating out your skills and figuring out how to adapt um, different things. And then a big part for that, especially as you get older, becomes the higher literature reading load. Um, and I'm just gonna go back, audiobooks. 
audiobooks, audiobooks, audiobooks. Um, there's so much yeah. you can learn with audiobooks. And when the frustration comes from being unable to take in the information that you need because there's struggles reading, then it doesn't matter that you're hearing it through your ears versus taking it in through your eyes. The point is that you're taking it in. Um, and so finding those other ways to do it. Um, and a lot of communities even have other disability supports that provide books on tape, like textbooks um, and different things. We use a program called Scribd for our for many, many audiobooks at our house. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I think for the younger kids, um, remembering that your child is an individual and that they're going to be learning on a unique timetable and that that is totally okay is really important because I think it's so easy to put so much pressure on our kids to be able to follow the same reading timeline as a sibling or as a friend's child and it just you just might not see that and I think that we really need to be okay with that. Um, and then from there, as you're teaching them to read, um, two strategies that I like. Number one, they are, there are colored overlays that you can get to go over top of a piece of paper. Um, this is super controversial. There are some people that swear by these and other people that swear it's a fraud. Um, and I think it, it depends on exactly what is, is happening in your child's brain. Um, technically, they're more of a vision support than a dyslexia support. But for some kids, they really actually do work. I had a child in my classroom that that was the key. It was yellow. And that when they had the yellow overlay, they were good to go. Um, so that, I mean, that's something to look into because if, if that is the answer, it's a really easy solution. Um, and then from there, just as many multi-sensory activities as you can. So having kids write letters in a tray of sand or putting out like some shaving cream in like the bathtub and having them write letters in there or uh, writing letters really big on a giant piece of easel paper and having them use their whole hand to write. Um, just any kind of strategies that you can use that incorporate more than, um, more than one sense and just help the kids to be able to see a little bit differently can help. Yeah, uh, funny story about multi-sensory. Um, right behind me uh, in my video is our whiteboard that we kind of use and our nonfiction books on the shelf. But directly behind me is our big old magnetic numbers. And I thought with my youngest being nine that we could get rid of those this year. And I put them in a bag and put them in the closet. And a week later, guess what we pulled out from the closet? Those same <laughs> letters to be uh -huh. used again. And they've been used a few times since. So. Mm -hmm. uh, multi-sensory isn't something that they, you know, is only for seven-year-olds. It's for older kids very much as well. There were some extra charts and stuff out this week as well so that they could have that sensory of moving up and down the number line and everything else. So. I love that. We have those well, magnetic Sarah, letters too. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, can you please tell everybody where they can find you? Um, and also maybe you can drop in the comments when we're done here as well, how they can follow you and keep up with you. Absolutely. My blog is over at homeschooling for him and I am at homeschooling for him on most of the social channels, um, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, um, and the workshop is coming up next week. And I think there's a link for that in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Um, both of us will be monitoring me. the comments. So, so if you have, mm -hmm. yes, so good. So we'll be monitoring the comments if you're watching the replay. Um, if you have other questions, uh, you can tag either one of us. And we're so glad you're here and part of this community. Have a great week, thank everyone. You.